Right. Word. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so thank you, Chelsea, for that introduction. Um, so I'm, as she mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about fault displacement hazard assessment uh, that we practice in consulting. And the focus of this is going to really be on how the pre-rupture fault mapping is going to help inform uh, the models and the methods that we use for assessing um, displacement hazard. It, it represents potentially a, a really important advance in our practice. Uh, the slide, um, the title slide that I have here shows one of the, the very rare examples where we have an opportunity to test the hazard assessments and the models that have been used to uh, mitigate fault displacement hazard. This is the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Um, and the pipeline is forced to cross the Denali Fault, a major strike slip fault. And uh, the pipeline, which was constructed in the 1970s, um, the investigations prior to the pipeline recognized the Denali Fault, and they recognized the potential for very large magnitude earthquakes that could result in very large displacements. And so they came up with an innovative design to accommodate that displacement. And what you can see here are various skids uh, and these, um, these vents that raise the pipeline up and over the ground surface. So the ground underneath was designed to be able to slide independently of the pipeline. And the pipeline was then specifically designed with these, uh, these angular bends to be able to accommodate the differential movement of the earth beneath it. So you can see before the earthquake and then a similar picture that was taken after the 2002 magnitude 7.9 earthquake where you can see the pipe being deformed in a right lateral sense and this big bow showing how the pipe was able to absorb some of that, um, some of that compression that the pipe was placed into given the orientation of the earthquake displacement. Um, and so this represents one of the few cases where we've been able to test, do our hazard approaches, do the engineering mitigation strategies, are they effective? Um, and uh, so this, this is what we're going for. We're hoping for future projects to be able to design important infrastructure to be resilient from displacement hazard. And we're hoping that um, we can have innovative but cost-effective designs um, help you know, minimize disruptions and, and minimize um, losses to, uh, to property and degradation to the environment. Okay. So the outline of the talk, we're gonna talk a little bit more about mitigating fault rupture hazard. I'm going to go through definitions and some examples of two different fundamental approaches to hazard assessment. One is a deterministic and one is a probabilistic type of hazard analysis. Then we're going to go and explore a little bit more in detail about the probabilistic fault displacement hazard analysis methodology um, using the Peterson et al. paper as the example. And we don't have time to go through the whole PFDHA methodology. And so we're really going to zoom in and focus on the role of pre-rupture fault mapping, which is again, you know, obviously the motivation for this class. Uh, at the end, as Chelsea said, we would love to have a discussion. We can go through the questions that uh, the students submitted and um, but again, as Chelsea said, if there are any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to um, interrupt. Okay, so hazard mitigation, that's it's something we hear about a lot. What we mean when we talk about mitigating hazards is we're looking for ways we can reduce the risk uh, of, of disasters to our society, or we're looking at ways to make our communities more resilient to hazards. So we wanna minimize um, loss of life. We wanna minimize loss of uh, you know, degradation to the environment. And we wanna minimize um, disruptions to, to the economy and, and to our 
um, to the way our society operates. Basically, we want to make things safer uh, through mitigation. And so there's the question, which is what is safe enough? And there's a balance. There's always a struggle between cost, trade-offs between cost and safety. And so one of the questions um, that comes up, you know, should we be designing our infrastructure and should we be making decisions that results in things being 100% seismically safe? Should we do complete mitigation? And, um, and a lot of structural engineers and seismic engineers love to say like, yes, we can design a perfectly, space build, a perfectly safe building, but you may wanna have windows in that building. You know, if we want to have a cost-effective, perfectly safe building, no windows, maybe we even won't put in a door, and, uh, but we can make it to be incredibly resilient from ground shaking. Um, that's, there's a trade-off that as a society, we want windows, we want interesting designs, we don't want our buildings and our infrastructure to cost too much money, and so there are trade-offs. Oftentimes, there are different objectives with design. We might have an objective that says um, we want to make sure that we're minimizing a loss of human life. We want to preserve human life. So we're willing, we're willing to have buildings be damaged during earthquakes and displacement events, but we're not willing to have, those, um, have that damage result in a large loss of life. And so that leads to certain decisions that are made Again, these are society decisions made between regulators, lawmakers, engineers, et cetera. And so when we are doing hazard assessment, our job as the geologist, as the hazard analyst, is we want to provide to the engineering community, to society, a characterization of the hazard. So there can be choices about, how, um, about what is basically safe enough. To what level do we want to be designing to? For fault rupture hazard, um, there are three fundamental mitigation options. We can choose to mitigate by avoidance. We can choose not to design buildings over active faults. This is a photograph from the 1999 Chi Chi Taiwan earthquake, um, where there are two apartment buildings one happened to be constructed across the scarp of the Chilinpu Fault and suffered some extreme tilt, no loss of life in this case, fortunately. The adjacent apartment building was constructed just enough onto the footwall that it was completely, um, it was able to completely avoid uh, major structural damage. And so an easy way for buildings, for discrete facilities, uh, an easy mitigation option is to try to mitigate by avoidance. We construct those facilities away from active faults. Uh, another option is to mitigate by design. For certain facilities, pipelines, uh, rail systems, um, uh, bridges, there often is no choice but to cross an active fault. And so we need to come up with ways to mitigate the hazard of fault displacement by designing for it. And again, that classic example, here's another photograph from the Trans-Alaska Pipeline taken immediately after the earthquake. And this shows one of the bents elevating the pipeline that performed just well enough that there was no damage to the pipe and it was a relatively simple exercise to then realign this skid to place it beneath the bend. And so, um, I, again, an example of where we're trying to mitigate by design. A third option is to decide that, you know, safe enough um, is, would result in no mitigation at all, that we're just going to accept the risk. And Chris Madugo mentioned that part of PG&E's decisions and other decisions, you look to see what the consequences of failure are. And if we're out in the middle of a desert and um, the, the worst thing that can happen is a telephone pole uh, falls over, well, we can accept that loss and we can accept the economic risk that we'll have to go out and replace that telephone pole after an earthquake. So one of the examples 
of, um, of, of this whole process of mitigating fault displacement hazard um, is the California Aquas Priolo Act. And this is an act that was passed uh, in the state of California following the 1971 San Fernando earthquake that occurred in uh, kind of the northern Los Angeles area. And this is a great example because one of the observations that we have is that the discussion that society has about what's safe enough often occurs immediately following major disasters. And so oftentimes the, the outcomes and the decisions are coming st straight on the heels of, of disasters that are very fresh in, in people's minds. So the outcome of the Alcos Priolo Act was a decision to for buildings with human that are designed for human habitation, uh, by and large, need to mitigate by avoiding active faults. And there's a criteria that these faults must be sufficiently active and well-defined. And so this is just an example of one uh, way to mitigate for buildings. Okay. Um, two fundamental approaches to hazard analysis, deterministic approaches and probabilistic approaches. In deterministic hazard analysis, we're really focused on worst case or maximum type of scenario earthquakes, where we don't explicitly consider the annual probability of this worst case earthquake occurring. It could be an incredibly rare earthquake or it could be a relatively common earthquake. But in a deterministic analysis, we decide, let's choose that worst case earthquake scenario. And then what we determine to be a measure of, of safe enough in our hazard is reflected in the percentile of that intensity measure. And by that I mean, um, is safe enough designing for the average fault displacement that we could expect from the worst case scenario? Or maybe do we decide that safe enough is the 84th percentile, something that's higher than the average, a greater than average displacement that could happen from that worst case scenario event? We'll go into an example of this in, in the next slide. Uh, the other form is a probabilistic hazard analysis, where instead of just examining a worst case, we're trying to capture all plausible scenarios of earthquakes and all of the outcomes that could result from that suite of uh, plausible scenarios. And for the probabilistic hazard analysis, rates of these scenarios are really important. Uh, many of you are familiar with Gutenberg-Richter relations, where you know that um, over, large, uh, over large areas, smaller earthquakes occur much more frequently than the largest earthquakes. And the relative rates and the absolute rates of these scenarios are a very important component to building probabilistic seismic hazard models. And for these, safe enough Instead of looking at different percentiles, do we look at the, the median, the 84th, et cetera, safe enough, we use the annual frequency of exceedance or some measure of the return period of the earthquake um, to determine what is safe enough. Okay. We're gonna go through an exercise here. Instead of going straight into Peterson et al and the Peterson et al hazard equation, I'm going to go through an exercise that should um, hopefully more intuitively describe how we come up with deterministic calculations and then how we convert these deterministic calculations into probabilistic uh, ex expressions of probabilistic hazard. And this example I'm going to show is um, an idealized case where we have a fault that produces a magnitude seven earthquake. And our task with fault displacement hazard is to try to capture if we're going to design or if we're gonna assess hazard at a certain point along this fault that produces magnitude seven earthquakes, we wanna understand how much ground displacement there's gonna be. 
And so what we're going to do in this exercise is we're going to assume that we can use a very simple fault displacement prediction equation that predicts displacement at a given site just as a function of magnitude. And we're going to say that our model includes a standard deviation on displacement of 0.3 log units. And by standard deviation, this is the variability, this is the, uns the natural variability and the uncertainty over what can happen from earthquake to earthquake uh, as uncertainty about some sort of average displacement that we calculate up here. Um, the third part of this example is we're gonna say that this scenario, magnitude seven earthquake, it's gonna occur once every thousand years on average. It has a mean recurrence interval of 1,000 years. So this plot down here is from um, a very often cited, well-known paper from Wells and Coppersmith in 1994. And this is a um, log normal relationship between moment magnitude and average displacement in meters. There are plots of different earthquakes with estimated average displacements of all different slip types, strike slip, normal and reverse. And you can see the data are fairly crummy, but we can fit a regression line through it. And so for a magnitude seven earthquake, on average, this suggests that displacements should be about a meter. And here, we show a probability density function using this equation. And the shape of this is a log normal distribution shape. And the width of this bar reflects that log normal standard deviation. And so what we're saying here is that the average displacement is going to be about a meter. But any given earthquake at, may produce at this location displacements that are less than the average or displacements that are greater than the average. And we can show this as a probability density function, and we can also sum from left to right and plot this exact same data as a cumulative distribution function, where we have our cumulative prob probability going from zero to one. And in that deterministic analysis that we discussed, the blue star represents the average. So this is saying maybe the appropriate deterministic uh, hazard level for our design should be the average, where we're willing to accept that half of the outcomes may produce a larger displacement, but we're protecting from um, you know, the possibility of the other 50% producing a less than average displacement. The other 84th percentiles represented by this green star you can see that this is a more conservative hazard level where we're now protecting against 84% of the likely outcomes. Our design value will be higher, but we're still allowing about 16% of the possible displacements at our site to be even larger, in which case, you know, maybe the performance of our facility is going to be compromised. And we can see that both in the PDF and with the CDF. So that was showing the outcome of a uh, deterministic assessment. If we wanna go now to a probabilistic formulation, we take that same information, that same cumulative distribution function, and we just take the complementary of it. So instead of summing cumulative probability zero to one, we just flip this and we call this an exceedance probability. So now we're plotting the same information but now we're looking at, we have a 100% probability that the exceedance is going to be some tiny value, given that the earthquake occurs at our site. We have that same median, that same 50th percentile, and our 84th percentile is now represented here, where there's only a 16% probability of exceedance. If we take this plot and we just convert it to a log-log scale, and now the other information that we had was we had information that the average recurrence interval of earthquakes was once every thousand years. And so if we convert that to a rate of earthquakes of one over a thousand years or one times 10 to the minus three, we can scale our 
cumulative distribution or complementary cumulative distribution function, we can scale this one to that rate, that mean rate of earthquakes. And now we've converted this from a deterministic type expression to a probabilistic formulation, where now we're showing the relationship between the annual exceedance frequency or annual exceedance probability against displacement. Now we're dealing in probabilistic hazard space. And as you can see, that same median and same 84th percentile, it's, they're all still visible and they carry through with all of these plots. Okay, so one of the other really important parts of PFDHA, and I, uh, I need to pick up the pace a little bit, one of the important aspects of a probabilistic analysis is we really try to incorporate uncertainty into our calculations and into our estimates. And they're very important concepts of uncertainty to communicate. The epistemic uncertainty, that's uncertainty in our model or when we're considering different model and um, alternatives. There is a correct average displacement, but we just don't know what it is and we don't know how to get there. So epistemic uncertainty is an expression of our uncertainty in our models. Aleatory uncertainty, which is also called aleatory variability, that's the expression of that natural variability. This is when we repeat the experiment, when we repeat the earthquakes again and again and again, there's an expectation that we're not gonna get perfectly repeatable behavior each and every time. Some of those earthquakes are gonna produce uh, less intensity measure effects. Some are gonna produce greater intensity measure effects than the average. And so one of the things we try to do is we try to construct logic trees to express our epistemic uncertainty. And so for a probabilistic analysis, we really need some sort of expression of what the mean displacement is. And this is showing a logic tree node with three different model alternatives for what the correct average displacement of the site might be. And so that first example I showed gave us an, an estimated average of a little over one meter at a site. If the, correct, if the correct model was actually one that would result in an average of almost two and a half meters, you can see the shift in both that deterministic formulation and you can see a shift in the hazard curve formulation. So uncertainty in our average results in our hazard curve moving uh, from left to right. Another thing we need is that expression of what's that natural variability? What's that aleatory variability from event to event? And our first model had an estimate of 0.3, and that produces a certain shape. If there's greater natural variability than we expected, that would result in a broader curve that results in, again, a broader hazard curve. If on the other hand, things are more periodic and more regular than our preferred model, that would result in a much more peaked probability density function and a much steeper hazard curve. And then lastly, and this gets to one of the aspects that we're gonna be looking at in this class, um, or, or one of the uh, outcomes of this class is gonna inform us about rates of events our starting model said that there was about a one in 1,000 mean uh, recurrence for this phenomena. But if we're wrong by a factor of two uh, and things are more frequent on average, that would result in our hazard curve going up. And if they occur less frequently than we thought, that results in our hazard curve going down. These don't affect our deterministic analysis at all but they have a very important effect on our probabilistic formulation. Okay, so again, one of the important parts of hazard analysis is the use of logic trees. They allow us to capture epistemic uncertainty, uncertainty in what the right model might be uh, for expressing our hazard. And certain types of uncertainties have different impacts over our probabilistic hazard curves. 
So different features of this can be more or less important for any given project. Uh, let's see, I'll keep going through here. Okay, so when we transition now to Peterson et al, and we transition to strike slip um, faulting, uh, I wanna make sure that, that everyone's clear on the fundamental terminology that we use. Um, Peterson et al talks a lot about principal fault and principal fault displacements. Uh, the same term, or the, the equivalent term primary is often used. And the idea of a principal rupture, twa rupture trace and principal displacement is this corresponds with typically the longest, most continuous expression of surface faulting. It's associated with the largest slips. So here are strike slip displacements from, I think, Hector Mine. Um, Tim, you can correct me. Uh, and these are measurements in centimeters. So we have um, greater than two up to about four meters of displacement along this principal uh, trace. In this section view, we think that these primary faults and these principal displacements are directly connected to our main seismogenic fault at depth. Peterson et al. also talks about distributed displacement. And a, a similar word is secondary faulting or secondary displacement. And on the picture here, we can see that these shorter, more discontinuous traces that have displacement amounts that are significantly less than principal slips, this is what we mean by our distributed displacements on our distributed faults or secondary faults. And you can see from the image here, the impression is that these secondary faults might be connected, but they're branching or splays or um, more secondary features to that primary fault. Um, there's another class of distributed deformation where uh, maybe there's an isolated rupture over here that doesn't have direct connectivity. Uh, maybe it moved sympathetically. And this is one of the sources of uncertainty in our models of how we treat these sympathetic ruptures compared to how we treat um, other things that are more clearly have a secondary branching relationship. Okay, so now we're getting to Peterson et al. And Peterson et al's formulation for probabilistic fault displacement hazard analysis. And I'm showing you here, uh, a, a, this isn't exactly from Peterson et al. This is the formulation that we use um, but it's, it's essentially the same. And this is the formulation for principal fault displacement as expressed by this capital D or capital D naught. Uh, as many of you know from the reading for distributed deformation, they're equivalent equations and lowercase d is used. This figure one on the right shows graphically how the model is set up where we're looking to assess hazard at a site given by coordinates X and Y, and that site has a spatial dimension Z. And it's located at a distance R away from a fault. Typically, with Peterson et al., because this is something that we're doing trying to forecast hazard going forward, this fault represents a mapped fault trace. Although the data that are collected, the rupture data, oftentimes we make these measurements from the actual rupture that occurred. Um, anyway, the R distance is the distance from the site to the principal fault. The location of where that rupture occurs along the fault is indicated by this bold line. And you notice from Peterson et al. that a lot of their main formulas, their main plots, showed displacement amount as a function of location along strike of where the rupture occurred. From the ends of the rupture, which has a normalized distance of zero, all the way to the midpoint of the rupture that has a normalized, normalized location of 0 0.5. Okay, so let's go through these terms. The first term here, alpha is, oh, so first of all, this formulation right here says the annual exceedance frequency of a displacement at site XY of dimension Z. So the annual exceedance frequency 
that a displacement of amount D is going to exceed a test displacement D naught. That's given by this full equation. This first term tells us something about the seismic source characterization. There was a question from a student, where does neotectonics fit in? Neotectonics fits in right here. This is the part of the formulation where we need to come up with a model that tells us the location, magnitude, recurrence, distribution of earthquakes for our analysis. So this is the rate of earthquakes above a minimum magnitude. And this is some formulation of the magnitude uh, and location relationship of earthquakes along our fault. The second term is unique to fault displacement hazard analysis. And this is a conditional probability that the earthquake, you know, given an earthquake style of faulting and given its magnitude m, this is the conditional probability that that earthquake will produce a surface fault rupture. So if we think of earthquakes, moderate and large earthquakes, if you're in the near field of that earthquake, every spot on the ground is going to shake. You're going to experience ground shaking everywhere. But for fault displacement, that's not necessarily true. Every earthquake, any earthquake of a given magnitude m, doesn't have a 100% probability of rupturing the surface. And so there are certain attempts to come up with this conditional probability. And typically, there are different models based on different styles of faulting. And what we find primarily after style of faulting, that the relationship with magnitude is, is, is important. Um, I won't go into that any further. Um, I'll skip to the last one right here in purple. This is our displacement exceedance equation. Again, this is most of Peterson et al. 2011, is they go through their models to talk about displacement exceedance. So given an earthquake occurs and it ruptures at the site, what's the amount that's likely going to happen? What's the, what's the average amount that can be expected at a site? What's that aleatory variability that can be expected as a site? Um, and so this is our displacement exceedance. This is also with Alex Sarmiento joining us. And um, as she explained, she's leading the database um, compilation effort for a new generation of fault displacement hazard models. Most of the focus thus far is on proving these. Okay, this last term in green, this is the part that I find to be the most interesting, and this is the focus of this class. These are the equations, these are the conditional probabilities that displacement is going to occur at our site of interest. So again, we're trying to do a hazard assessment at this location XY, typically of a site dimension Z. And given that we have a certain magnitude distribution of earthquakes, given that we already have an expression to know how frequently those break the surface, Okay, given that they break the surface, what again is the conditional probability that displacement's gonna occur at that site I care about? And so it's expressed as the conditional probability at our location x, y of dimension z that our displacement's gonna be non-zero. And it's gonna be a function of our site size, z. It's gonna be a function of the distance away from uh, the principal fault, and it's going to be conditioned, of course, on the fact that that earthquake ruptures the ground surface. This term over here we'll get into a little bit. This is our fault location uncertainty term, and that's part of this conditional probability expression. Okay, um, so let's let's look at that um, 